Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. This one has been sitting on my Teardown shelf for quite some time. It came in a uh, quite an old mailbag episode now. It come, came from uh, Joey in the UK, so thank you very much, Joey. It is an airbag control unit from a uh, fairly recent model um, Hyundai car that has uh, seen better days, apparently. So uh, this could be really interesting. And uh, for those playing along at home, there's the part number there, and there's another, well, it's manufactured by TRW, that's the TRW part number, and uh, works on a 12-volt system, and uh, we'll have a look at how an airbag controller works, although I'm not sure how much we're actually going to be able to glean from this thing, but one thing we do know, for starters here, is look at this forward arrow here. Obviously, that is... Uh, designed to indicate that the unit must be installed in the car in a certain way because airbags only activate with a basically pretty much a front-on front on collision or at a certain angle to a front-on collision like that. So obviously that means it's going to have an internal uh, accelerometer or sensor in there to, uh, you know, some sort of inertial switch or something to detect that, uh, to detect the crash. But uh, I believe old model uh, airbag controllers, they did use mechanical inertial, uh, in, inertial switches or something like that, some sort of mechanical de device to detect it. But uh, all the fairly modern ones, including this one, I'm sure, use a MEMS uh, accelerometer. So that'll just be mounted on the PCB, or it could be mounted on its own PCB in there or something like that. We won't know until we take it apart. But I also believe that that's not the only uh, sensor in the car for activating these airbags. Don't uh, quote me on this, but I believe there are other, especially in these modern cars, lots of other sensors uh, mounted around the car. So it requires multiple sensors to be activated before this thing will actually blow the airbag. And uh, like passenger passenger detection switches and all sorts of, uh, you know, weird and wonderful sensors all placed around the car and lots of algorithmic control inside this thing. Now, I've already, um, I've showed a preview of this in the mailbag before. I've already taken off the metal backing plate from this. It just came off with a couple of screws. I don't have that anymore, but it's gone. And uh, clearly, we've actually got quite a few connections on here. So, Obviously, um, you know, it, there's quite a bit of uh, data coming in and out of this thing. And as I said, most likely a lot of those are coming from other sensors within the car. So um, we're going to have to try and lever this board out. I think we might be able to lever it out. And these pins are really quite interesting. As you can see, they are not soldered. They are actually uh, press fit pins, which... Uh, uh, as the name implies, you just press these connectors into the PCB and they just start uh, hold themselves in place with friction. Now, you might think, um, you know, airbag controllers have to be ultra reliable past many stringent, uh, you know, approvals and type testing and things like that. And you might wonder how the hell they can get away with not soldering the pins like that. Well, it, as it turns out, these uh, press fit connectors are actually incredibly reliable, but there is a lot of art which goes into getting uh, them right and making them reliable. So the exact diameter of the pin hole, the, the plating and all that sort of uh, stuff in the hole and getting just exactly the right pressure on those little um, press fit pins down in there. There's, you know, a lot that goes into that. And, uh, yeah, they would have had to have that approved. Much vibration and shock testing and all sorts of stuff goes into that. But, yeah, trust me, um, you find these in a lot of uh, ultra-high reliability industries where they don't actually solder because solder joints can be uh, brittle. They can crack under stress and vibration and stuff like that. So it can actually be more reliable to have these press-fit connectors. And they've got another one over there, and they've got another big device underneath. I'm not actually sure what that is and that's got a few press fit connectors as well and you can actually see that looks like a um, some sort of programming uh, port something like that whether or not it's a JTAG port or whether or not um, maybe it's designed for getting the data out because I believe these airbag units contain 
and E squared prom in them. Uh, they actually store the data from any uh, incident, i.e., crash, you know, so that the investigators can come along, read out the data, see exactly, you know, if somebody's killed by an airbag or something. Obviously, you know, there's going to be an investigation, they'll get the data out of it and stuff like that. So um, I'd be surprised if uh, there's not an E squared prom inside here somewhere and probably a, a reasonable amount of uh, processing power as well. As I said, there's lots of uh, proprietary algorithms which go into these airbag controllers these days. And uh, I'm not sure if this thing is going to prize out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I thought maybe we might have to prize out the connectors of the pins, but hang on. Hey, no, that's, that's coming out pretty easy. Pretty easy. Yep. Yep. No problem. Ta-da! Oh, we're in like Flynn. Look at that. Hey, look at that huge... Look at that huge cap on there. That's uh, rather surprising. And the board is conformally coded. You can see that all around here. You can see the... I get it at the right angle of the light. You can really see that. It's not completely dipped. They haven't completely gone and dipped the entire board in conformal coding. Like, there's no conformal coding over, well, the top of this chip here and uh, and the cap and everything else. So they've... Um, clearly, someone's gone over that with a uh, brush and just brushed on that conformal coding. Conformal coding is very common in, uh, in, in an ultra-high reliability uh, device like this because it uh, keeps out the moisture and uh, from the board and uh, ensures that it works over a huge um, range of uh, climates because uh, you know who knows what climates these uh, uh, airbags in different countries and things like that um, many different varying climates but uh, yeah it's not a full conform conformal coating I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't been completely gunked actually but uh, the big capacitor there, that's rather interesting. That's obviously that device. Yeah, that's the device on the bottom that had the press fit pins. There's no electrical connection on those ones. But there's the two pins for the cap there. And uh, they've gone to a lot of trouble to mount that cap in its own big custom housing. It's not very long. It's not as long as the entire thing. Um, well, maybe they ended up putting a shorter cap in, but it could certainly fit a longer cap in there and what that's for my guess would be um, well it's you know it's obviously not for regular power supply smoothing right you can bet your bottom dollar on that when you've got a capacitor that large it stores a massive well quite a large amount of uh, energy and uh, what that energy is used for either either it's directly on the supply rail it's actually powering the supply rail and then if there's a power failure in the car there's still enough power on the rail to keep the circuitry going to blow the airbag or whether or not it's just the energy storage device that then you know because it needs some extra grunt perhaps to blow the airbag but that's not likely because we're in a 12 volt automotive system we've already got you know, a big low impedance 12 volt path coming from the main uh, vehicle supply. So really, you know, you don't need it. So I reckon that's most likely reason for that is a backup, um, you know, is to supply the power to all this to keep it going after the crash. Because after the crash, as I said, you have to write to that E squared prom as well. That would be a... Uh, uh, you know, that would be a requirement of these modules, probably to pass type approval and things like that. They've got to, you know, because in a uh, crash, you don't want to crash, and then all your wiring going to this thing gets uh, severed, and then you lose power, and it doesn't have time to write the data to the E squared prom or something like that. I don't know. It's unlikely. It doesn't take much time to write, but maybe that's part of the uh, probably stringent requirements. If anyone has any data... Um, you know, documents on the requirements for these airbag controllers, then please uh, post it, because I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in the uh, red tape which goes behind getting one of these things approved. Um, I can't see any type of approval marks or uh, anything like that, but of course they would very well be. And that may be another reason why this capacitor is in its own little protective cage like that, is that there's going to be some shock uh, uh, there's going to be sh some shock protection inside that. I mean, they've got the leads, you know, there's going to be some compliance in the, in the leads there and in this plastic housing. So in a big accident like this, they're protecting 
the capacitor as the supply of the voltage to this airbag controller to ensure that the uh, charges blow on the airbags and that that uh, crash data is written to an E squared prom in here somewhere. And the other thing is I'm quite surprised at the amount of processing in this thing. I thought it would have a bit, but uh, yeah, we've got a large quad flat pack, another one under there. We've got quite a few QFN type packages around here by the looks of it. Ah, there's an 8-pin SO. That could be the E squared prom perhaps. Um, but yeah, let's take a closer look at the board. Missing device over here. Don't know what's going on there. And I'll tell you what, that capacitor took some prizing out, that's for sure. It's even got its own little uh, barcoded part number on there. And another 8-pin SO, maybe the crash data inside there perhaps. But there we go, we can get a good look at all the components now. And the connection for that capacitor looks like it's some... Uh, maybe welded stud or uh, something like that. It uh, hasn't just been uh, soldered onto there, that's for sure. And the capacitor in that, uh, as you expect, not a one hung low brand, it's a Nippon Chemicon uh, brand, you know, basically one of the world's best capacitors, uh, 8400 microfarads, 25 volts, and it's an LGB series, and I went and looked that up, and sure enough, this is a specific series of capacitors designed for airbag applications. There you go. Um, so probably much more uh, stringent manufacturing or uh, testing requirements or something like that. Maybe some extra uh, shock and vibration resistance and I don't, you know, 105 degrees C uh, temperature rated. But um, yeah, specifically designed for airbag applications. Interesting. Now unfortunately the conformal coding might make it very difficult to read some of the part numbers here, but uh, I'll have a go and I'll probably try and scrape it off if I have to. I'm not going to have time to, you know, uh, use any uh, solvent to try and get rid of it or, or something like that. So if I can uh, read them at a certain angle under the uh, microscope with light at a certain angle, then I'll try and do that. Otherwise, I'll scrape it off. And the main processor down in there, well, no surprises, it's a Renesis part. Renesis uh, the number one microcontroller manufacturer in the world because they uh, almost dominate the automotive market or they've got a massive share in the automotive uh, microcontroller market and uh, it's a H8SX uh, 1725 series and well you go look this one up I'll provide the links below for these things uh, if you want to check out the uh, data sheets and uh, websites for these but I found a press release uh, for this uh, series the 1700 series from uh, 2007 saying this one is specific this series specifically designed for in vehicle control application and airbag controllers so there you go um, another example of where the automotive industry has such clout that, you know, in terms of volume and, uh, you know, um, the, uh, profit margin and stuff like that, that these companies bend over backwards to design specific chips and specific series and, as you saw, a specific type of capacitor directly for these applications. They target them precisely. Unusual. It's a two-pin package, one large pin on the bottom there and one... Uh, J lead uh, coming out the side there and it's probably some sort of uh, diode or something like that can't see any uh, type markings on the top through that bubbly conformal coating but yeah most likely some sort of big ass diode look at the huge pad on the bottom and how it's heat sunk and there's just a little uh, four pin data line choke there to keep all the uh, crap off the uh, uh, data line coming from wherever it is coming from I don't know but uh, yeah probably part of the uh, CAN bus there and this one took a little bit of finding it's a TLE 8760V and uh, as, as you can see by the components surrounding it the big inductors all the caps all those passive parts it's obviously uh, something to do with the uh, power supply and sure enough um, it's an Infineon part once again specifically uh, designed for automotive applications and the example application they show in their uh, brochure for this thing couldn't get a data sheet but I got a you know <clears throat> a sales brochure on their automotive stuff specifically for airbag 
control systems and it is a power management uh, controller pretty much it's got a boost con it's got a buck converter in there I think it's got two boost converters it's got a linear reg in there it's got a reset uh, watchdog system all in one chip but once again specifically designed for the automotive market and here's Infineon's airbag system solution from their glossy brochure which they give to all the uh, car company executives and design teams and there it is that's what we just looked at the TLE 8760 and maybe there's other TLE uh, parts in here as well I mean these are the squib drivers for the um, airbags and you can see how tied in these things are I mean look there's you know buckle switches down here pressure sensors over here accelerometers and many accelerometers come in here that's a they've got a, an interface chip specifically for that and of course they're pushing their own uh, Infineon pushing their own MCU here I'm not sure how many uh, how many design wins they get but I'm sure they get uh, enough but that's what's in Inside their particular airbag ECU solution but it seems like TRW have gone for a mix at the very least just at the components we've looked at uh, so far they've gone for a main Renesis uh, CPU and then some Infineon uh, stuff around that at least one part and there's probably wouldn't surprise me if there's a few more Infineon parts in there or Renesis parts perhaps the part number on that second largest uh, quad flat pad part there I do oh, that's tricky but it is quite easy if you view this through the mantis scope at a uh, shallow enough angle with the light there we go it's an ST part and I can't find any data on that one again at first uh, search it's got 155457-2 MS84DC 99140v6 version 6 perhaps I don't know but it's definitely an ST part and bingo we have ourselves the accelerometer down here but I'm surprised that it's uh, two separate devices it's not just uh, one MEMS accelerometer we've got ourselves two these are uh, Freescale MMA uh, 6800 series this one here is the MMA 6821 and this one's the MMA 6856 to the data sheet once again, very specifically designed for automotive airbag systems. It's a um, SPI-based two-axis medium-G overdamped lateral accelerometer. Woohoo! And it's part of their Safer Shore system. Beautiful. Specifically tailored for the market once again. Plus minus 20G to plus minus 120G. Uh, you know, single supply SPI uh, compatible. 10-bit uh, digital signed or unsigned SPI output, uh, 12 low-pass filter options, Woo! 50 hertz to 1000 hertz optional offset cancellation, all sorts of goodness down here. So we have the 2-1, which is the 120G on the x-axis and plus minus 25G on the y-axis. And check out the block diagram of this puppy. Here we go, we've got our overdamped uh, y sensor and our X sensor in here and we've got a Delta Sigma converter, sine C filter, various low pass filters, compensation, linear interpolation, offset cancellation, output scaling, ah oh, wonderful stuff, it's got a built in 8 meg oscillator and digital regulators and all sorts of uh, power supply stuff and it's got its own um, internal array, one time programmable array in there and uh, this is a dual um, axis one but the other chip the 6856 is identical to this except it only has the X axis in here it doesn't have this Y axis on the top and that part there looks like some sort of SMD diode but it's actually a 10 megahertz crystal and the remaining parts on the board are once again very difficult to find information but I did get the uh, E squared PROM that was pretty easy that's an STM 95256 256k bit E squared PROM so that would have the uh, that would be storing the crash data in that thing presumably and this one down in here has got S5051G on it and I have not been able to find any data on that one so sorry no idea and that one there, no surprises for guessing, that's a CAN bus driver and that's an Infineon TLE 6250G. So they did, uh, you know, at least use some other Infineon parts on here. So let's say we rip that E squared prom off and see if we can read it, huh? It's worth a shot. 
Well, it really wasn't nice getting that chip out with that conformal coating on it. Let me tell you, it was real difficult. I used uh, some uh, chip quick uh, solder here and really it was a real dog to get off. Um, I almost thought that I killed it, almost thought I damaged it, but no, I managed to uh, get it out relatively intact and uh, uh, put it in my little um, SO ZIF socket here. So let's read the contents or try to. And here it is, excuse the uh, lack of proper screen capture here. And uh, all the top bit of it is FFFFFF. Of course, uh, my little, um, you know, $30 programmer actually uh, supported this ST device. But look, we've got some data. And bingo, look, null, null, null. And that looks like some real data. There we go. DS2S. CSP1K, I have no idea what that is, but uh, it looks like we do have some legitimate data out of this thing. And we'll, we'll, we've got some numerical sequences there. And uh, of course, I didn't really expect to find anything that exciting in here. It's not like, you know, it's, it's just, it's, um, well, as I said, uh, presumably a par part of its function is to store the uh, crash data in here. So, who knows about the contents, but anyway, I was able to read it, and uh, presumably, after a crash, if it was involved in a crash, you could, uh, if you knew how to, you could uh, reset the data and uh, reprogram that chip and put it back into use, but geez, that'd be pretty desperate. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the teardown of that uh, reasonably modern airbag controller there, and uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised at the uh, complexity of this thing, but you know, these modern things, more and more standards, more and more algorithms go into detecting the things and stuff like that, so uh, you know, uh, fairly advanced uh, stuff in these airbag controllers, and super duper reliable, um, and they use a lot of specific parts designed specifically by the chip manufacturers for the airbag market, which, uh, you know, it isn't surprising in the automotive industry, but if you're not used to that sort of industry, then you go, well, you know, why can't they design a special chip for me, for my industry? Well, they do. I've worked in the uh, seismic industry where uh, manufacturers provide specific ICs designed just for seismic data acquisition, you know, world-leading Delta Sigma converters, for example, that are specifically designed for the low uh, sample rates and things like that. Similar in the automotive here, although not as sort of uh, specialized, really. They, you could use them as more uh, generic parts, like the main processor here, for example, isn't just for airbag controls. That's just one of the recommended applications. They also recommend it can be used for, um, you know, other dash uh, stuff, more, uh, more generic uh, sort of processing and things like that. So... There you go. Um, if you do have any info on some of the parts which I couldn't identify in there, please leave them in the comments. And if you want to discuss it, uh, the comments or the EV blog forum is the place to do it. If you like Teardown Tuesday, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.